Just don't let it kill me, okay? I'll try not to. Okay. <laughs> you never count your babies until they're on the ground. I tell you what, it is pretty spectacular to have an alligator like RJ that is so docile that you can trust and listen. It's not that I just trust him blindly. The fact is, is that I know everything he does. Right now, even with me holding him, I can see if he starts to tense up and I know if I have to worry about him maybe hitting me this way. Now, I'd never be concerned about him snapping at me or anything like that, but the fact is he has a really bony head and he could come and kind of knock me out or knock my teeth out or something like that. So every time I'm holding him, I'm really reading his body language and I always tell people, listen, alligators aren't pets. They really aren't, you know. I know that I show these amazing animals and there's Bubba and there's other great alligators that educators are using, but it's not something that I think most people should have because they probably don't have the room, the ability to care for them, or even the knowledge of how to work with these guys. I mean, I started working with alligators about 10 or 12 years ago. Many years before that, I just was around them a little bit. So I have so much knowledge of how to do it and I am learning all the time. When I go down to Gatorland or out to Critchlow's Alligator Sanctuary or down to Crocodile Cows or whoever has crocodilians. I always learn so much about these animals because they are truly fascinating. I gotta be honest with you, when it comes to all reptiles, I think crocodilians are the most fascinating animals really because there's just so much variety. They're obviously apex predators. They're so intelligent. They've been around for 260 million years. I mean, how incredible is that? But as for now, I'm gonna go ahead, let RJ back in his pond. Let him get back in there, whatever he wants to do. Go ahead, buddy. There you go, sweetheart. There you go. There you go. Oh God. I tell you what, I absolutely love his pond. And some people have asked like, you know, right now it's completely fine. I mean, he's got tons of water, tons of space and stuff like that. But yeah, eventually he is gonna need a bigger pond. And I've been thinking about what I'm gonna do here in the next two or three years when he does outgrow this. Will I rip this out and put something else in a spot? Possibly. If I expand the reptarium larger, would I make a big enclosure for RJ? Good chance of that because I think it would be really cool to have him on display and to be able to pull him out without having to walk him next door. I don't know, but I know that as he grows, he'll continue to get better and better housing. And I'll continue to learn more and more how to make sure the rest of his life is truly amazing because I hope I have him for my entire life. And with that said, Welcome to the vlog. I did want to do a quick update on Bert and Ernie, and I'll be honest with you, I try not to handle them hardly at all. I know they can be really delicate, obviously, not only is their shell soft, but obviously that heart issue and stuff like that, but I did want to give you guys an update. They're still doing well, they're still eating, they still seem completely fine. I mean, definitely a little weak compared to what I would think a normal turtle like this is. I know we have a long way to go before I can like put this over at the reptarium and let everyone see them, but for now, they're at least still doing well, they're still eating well, Mary's taking really good care of them. I did want to kind of update you. And again, I don't like to really touch them that much because I realize if that stomach ruptures at all, it's it's game over. So I try to leave these guys in the tank as much as I can. I have seen them swimming around quite a bit more, a lot more than they used to, so that's a good sign. But you can see it's so small and so delicate. I'm really not sure what the future is. I'm very optimistic. We're gonna do everything we possibly can do. And like I've told you guys in the past, you know, I don't know. I mean, we definitely have an uphill battle, but with that being said, they are super cute and I sure hope that they go well because I think a really big one of these would be so cool for people to be able to see over at the Reptarium. They're so absolutely adorable. So the moment of truth, will our little cactus lollipops work with Matilda? Because again, this is what we're hoping to offer for a feeding with Matilda. See if she'll like them. There she goes. She likes it. Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh, here's got a little buddy coming. Oh, oh there goes it. <laughs> I think that worked out really well, huh? Yeah, I think that uh, she really likes them, and I think when she sees them coming, she's going to be excited. That's awesome. What we have to do now is, again, just kind of train her now that whenever she sees that, again, much like I'm talking about with behavior, when she sees that stick coming out with the cactus pad on it, she's probably just going to run over and she's going to love it. And this is really good for her, too, so it's going to be absolutely amazing. So that worked out well. One thing I did want to address really quick, not to continue to go on the negatives, but some people talk about my color coding of things, and for some reason, a few people have said, oh, if there's certain color tag that means an animal is sick listen it doesn't mean that at all I mean you can see we use pink we use purple we use blue uh, these tags are actually lay tags so it's if you see a tag in the background guys it doesn't mean anything about the color it's just whatever sticky notepad that we have at the time we do make notes and when there is an animal that is ailing in some ways yes we do put a sticky note on it so that we all know hey maybe we want to pay attention to this oh we have to do this or we have to have our vet check it out which by the way yes I do work with vets I work with vets all the time I'm constantly 
in contact. Whenever we do have an issue that we can't treat ourselves, we call in a vet to help. So whenever there's any problems, I always reach out to my vet. I'm so ready to start hatching babies. You can see some of these racks have some amazing babies in them right now. Take a look at this beautiful banana enchi ball python right here. Ooh, doggy. And you know, just walking through, I'm always like, oh my God, there's so much cool stuff. It's so cool. This, of course, is a banana city right here. Oh my gosh. And I think this is our last banana city that actually didn't even get on the website yet. I think Lori is finally putting some of the last stuff up on the website this week. So anyways, it's cool to kind of come down and see these racks, but I wanted to show you real quick. Look at these racks here. Empty, 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 empty. So we are getting so low. We've got to get some eggs soon, guys, so we can start hatching the babies. The racks are definitely getting pretty slim, but we are literally right around the corner. I think my first clutch of ball pythons is due to be laid in about a week and a half. That is going to be exciting. As you guys know that the colubrid season is well on the way. These guys are together right now. These are just some really beautiful corn snakes that are het for scale as creamsicles, so with any luck, we'll have some there. Those are our older stock that have been around for a while. Then, of course, these are the Terra Humera Mountain King are no black eye that are going together. So with any luck, we'll produce some of those. We have some new stock raising up with those guys. They are absolutely incredible. So I hope we'll produce some of those for sure. Of course, I've showed you before, sticking with the Pyram line. These are the albino Arizona mountain king snakes. Who <laughs> doggy. Well, they have very small clutches. I mean, you're looking at maybe three to five eggs and they only produce once a year. So definitely not a high production animal, but still pretty cool. These guys, on the other hand, can be pretty high production. These are Pueblin milk snakes and we'll have up to 10 eggs in a clutch and they'll produce two clutches every Every single year and typically with colubrids a lot of times the second clutch is actually smaller than the first clutch but with pueblins oftentimes it's the exact same size and every now and then you even get a third clutch from them definitely high production animals we have a lot of texas rat snakes but i really love these snow texas rat snakes and what we're doing this year is we're breeding snows to aneurthristics that are het for snow so with any luck we'll get some more snows and some more aneurthristics that are het for snow because both aneurthristic and the albino that makes the snow are recessive then of course look at these texas rat snakes here of course this is a scaleless Texas rat snake and it looks a lot like Joker actually I've never noticed that its head looks almost exactly like Joker over at the Reptarium but Joker's not breeding this year he typically has been in the breeding cycle but he has a year off because he's entertaining people over at the Reptarium and I love these guys I tell you what albino Honduran milk snakes who doggy these things are absolutely gorgeous we started producing these way back in the day I've told the story before we had the very first ones in the country so we were really on the front end of the albino Honduran milk snake and oftentimes I've told people that really that's what kicked off BHB. If it wasn't for the albino Hondurans, I probably wouldn't be where I am today because it kind of put us on the map. It was the first time we had an exclusive project that everyone seemed to want. And speaking about an animal that everyone wanted, these are actually the albino Nelson's milk snakes. And when these first came out, a guy named Doug Moody produced them and everybody had to have them. They were $2,000 a piece for little baby albinos and there was a waiting list. It was almost impossible to get them. Thankfully, now they're relatively inexpensive, under $100 and absolutely gorgeous snakes. Couldn't be more over the top excited about Cal King production this year. We used to have a really big group of California King snakes and over the last few years we haven't produced very many. Well we have a bunch more that are up to size this year so it should be really good like this lavender snow cow. Ooh doggy that thing is absolutely gorgeous and we have a whole bunch of other stuff that'll be up to size next year so our production will even get that much cooler. But with that said this albino high white California King snake that thing is pretty cool. It's going to be hard to get much cooler than that so excited to produce some more of these little monkeys this year. And we have a bunch of new Brooks Kings up to size. Again, I used to produce a ton of Brooks Kings. And I think last year we had like one or two clutches. So it's going to be cool to get these back in the production scheme for sure. Like this aneurythristic right here that is unbelievably gorgeous. Or this albino jelly Brooks King. Ooh, doggy. That thing is awesome as well. And I think you guys know by now that I love garter snakes. This happens to be an albino checkered garter snake. And she's already starting to look a little bit plump. Like she's starting to swell up already. It does happen pretty quick and these guys aren't egg layers they're actually live bears so we'll definitely have some little baby albino garter snakes in the not too distant future and you can see right here this female mexican black king just shed that is actually that post hibernation shed that i've talked about before where that means that she's starting to produce follicles and that's when you want to breed her she has a male in with her of course with this marker mark here so we know which one's the male so she is ready to go we should definitely start to see some copulation from them and mexican black kings oh my god they are so popular and i I sure hope we produce these cute little monkeys this year. We definitely have a bunch of hog nose up to size to breed. 
And just like so many of the other projects, we're raising up new groups. So next year is actually gonna be a really big bump in a lot of our Kaluber production. But I tell you what, you couldn't get much cuter than this. And a female like this can literally have 14, even sometimes up to 20 eggs. And much like the Pueblo milk snake, these guys will have two, sometimes even three clutches a year. This pairing here is actually pretty cool. This is actually our blizzard male here, but this female here is actually a blizzard sun kiss corn, and she is looking really good too. That sun kiss is actually a mutation that just kind of changes the pattern and color of the animal a little bit. So it'd be really cool to produce some blizzards. The one thing about sun kiss you have to be careful of, there's actually a gene that was in it that was called stargazing gene. Now the ones we have have never had stargazing, so we've never had to deal with it, but some of the lines of sun kiss will have it where the snakes will actually wobble, much like a spider, and don't even get me started on that one. I feel like it's been forever since I've shown you snap, crackle, and pop. This happens to be snap, crackles next door, and then pop is right over here too. They're getting absolutely huge. And again, you wanna feed these guys smaller meals, so even though they're getting big, they don't eat something about the size you would think. This could probably eat a small, large rat, but believe it or not, we keep them on small to very small medium rats because you don't wanna get them really big and fat. That can shorten the lifespan of a blackhead quicker than you can possibly imagine. Not to mention, if it's a female and you start feeding it too much, it typically will never produce. And of course, they have these black heads because this is what they use to thermoregulate. They'll actually stick their heads out of the crevices, just that top of the head, and the sun will go down on that black, which will attract the sun, and it warms their entire body. That way, they don't have to expose themselves to predation being out sunning its entire body. What a cool adaptation. And again, basically, these guys are a lot like Woma pythons, just with that absolutely stunning black head. I've mentioned a bunch that kind of the biggest surprise of the Reptarium is the popularity of the Rachted Wall. Bruce really heads it up back here. He does it all. But you know, I've been a little bit disappointed because there's been a couple empty cages. This one and this one. What, what are we going to do about this? Well, Brian, I'm actually here to tell you that there is no longer any more disappointment needed. I have two very, very special tarantulas on their way. On their way. And they're very beautiful. But it's a surprise. I want to tell you. What? I want to tell you. Can you give me a hint? One's an uh, old world tarantula. Okay. There's, there's, your, there's the first hint. And the other one is a very commonly seen tarantula. A lot of people see them in the pet trade a lot. But there's actually kind of a mover. So you might be a little freaked out with a it, but it's oh, totally yeah. safe. You're not going to be any danger with her to hold it. Great. Just what I need. <laughs> I've already been getting over my fears. Now I can pick up the scorpion. Now I can pick up the trenches. Now you're giving me one. The fast ones freak me out, but I'm leaving up to him. Obviously, I was trying to see if I could get a hint out of him. Obviously, he's not going to give me it. So when are they coming? Not going to happen. Not telling you. Let's, let's put it this way. Give me another about a couple weeks. Let, right. let me have them come in shipped in and we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna rock them. all right so there it is guys couple more weeks and i get to surprise you with whatever bruce has up his hand just don't let it kill me okay i'll try not to okay <laughs> <laughs> i keep mentioning how excited i am about the blue tongue skink breeding season but one of the things i'm probably the most excited about is girls like this which is the eastern blue tongue skinks i've been producing northerns now for the last several years but i've never had a litter of eastern jet this is a hypo eastern right here and we have a handful of easterns that look like they're getting full look at how big her stomach is she is definitely getting full up of babies i am so excited about that again little baby easterns is something i've been dreaming about producing for Ever. And it looks like possibly this year we might finally produce them. But again, you never count your babies until they're on the ground. And look at this chunky monkey here. This is a caramel northern blue tongue skink. Basically just a real recap if you want to know how to breed these guys. The northerns actually cool down to like maybe 70, 72 degrees for a couple months. And we usually do that like November, December. But the easterns need to cool a little more. We took them down into the low 60s this year for about two months. Then we brought them up at the end of December, early January. We started putting them together. We got between two and three locks with each of the females and then we shelved them and then basically you'll have babies roughly about three months later so I think we're about a month and a half into the three month wait so again a month and a half from now we should start having a bunch of northern babies and then hopefully some easterns and we always have a lot of cool little pet projects that we work on you can see this apricot pueblin has a really interesting triad pattern so sometimes we'll breed little anomalies like this and see if they're inherent if they are we'll raise them up and we'll continue to breed them and see if we can't kind of change the overall look of the snake this is pretty Pretty cool. It's just a little exciting dinker project. And obviously you guys have seen all of the scaleless stuff that I got from Forrest and Desiree, so we're definitely really excited about these guys breeding as well. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview. I mean, trust me, there are tons of things I didn't cover. It's gonna be a really exciting year, and I'm gonna take you guys along on all of the egg polling this year, so you guys will kind of see it as it goes. We're not too far off, maybe three, four weeks away from our first eggs. At the end of a very long day, but you know, it's been a while since I've kind of shut the lights off here and give you guys a little bit of a tour of the Reptarium 
at night. Again, I do this every single night that I'm here because normally I'm here till after dark. So it's really cool to just kind of shut off the lights. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that right now for you guys. I just think it takes on a completely different look. I mean, look at how amazing Lucy looks in there. Everything just pops at night. I mean, the cages look great. Snazzy's over here. I mean, look at that. Pickles. Oh my gosh. We've got the Veil Chameleon. Betty Wap Puck here. Look at Daisy over there looking absolutely incredible. Abasuku's in the water where she always is. Here's my girl Bella in the back there. Oh my gosh, look at Erwin. I just love the way this looks at night. It's so cool. And again, it's been a while since I showed you guys this. Look at the gators just hanging out over here. Monkey tail skinks over here. Here's Perdita hanging out up on the rock up there looking absolutely incredible. The powder blue dart frogs, I tell you, it's just amazing. I love this place at night. And with that said, be kind to somebody, people. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you.